over. So thank you so much for joining us for Hot Topics and Post-Secondary Partnerships. And I'm so glad to have Carly Rochelle joining us to run the show. Thank you so much, Carly. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Hopefully everybody is in the right place. This afternoon, we're going to discuss hot topics in post-secondary partnerships. Um, that phrase, hot topics, it, you might be thinking about the store at the mall, but what we kind of wanted to focus on was just like kind of these news breaking current event type phrases that maybe you've heard a few times and you keep hearing them. And now we have um, an opportunity this afternoon to kind of dig in. Um, my name is Carly Voschel. I am working with Atlas as their transitions coordinator. I just started in August. So this is actually the first webinar that I have planned and coordinated and I'm helping to facilitate, but I'm not here all on my own presenting. I've got um, a great, group of content experts here to share about these three concepts that we're going to, going to talk about. Um, again, I've um, been hearing some of these terms, co-requisite model, ability to benefit. You know, you see a new acronym or you hear a phrase, and if you're like me, you're at the meeting and you're thinking, does everybody know what that means? And you might be like, do I ask? Do I try to learn more? But you kind of wonder, is this, you know, just a little blip that we can kind of move past and not really have to figure it out? Well, then you keep hearing these terms over and over and you realize that, okay, I've got to dig in and see how this affects me, my students, and that's where we're at. There's changes that are happening in the Minnesota state system, and it's ultimately going to change um, the way that we partner in ABE with post-secondary partnerships. So these are the three topics that we're going to look at today. Ability to benefit, self-guided placement and the co-requisite model and the shift from development, developmental education. Kind of the overarching theme with all three of these, you know, is how do they interact and affect the adult learners that we work with at our ABE program. Throughout this presentation, we're going to be using um, a Google Doc for questions and for notes. And Marisa is going to share that in the chat. So that is something else that you might want to kind of click on and open up um, on your browser. Uh, there's spots there for each of the three categories. So while you're listening to the presentation and later when you get into the breakouts, that's where you can add a question. Uh, we'll ask folks to take notes later in the breakout rooms. This is gonna be a nice resource for people who are at the session or who are watching the recording afterwards or looking for these types of resources in the future. So just to kind of set the stage here um, about post-secondary partnerships with ABE, um, we're going to have content experts and information about the Minnesota State College System, which is a large system with 26 colleges, seven universities, many campuses, lots and lots of academic programs, and they serve about 300,000 students per year. Um, when we hear presentations about ability to benefit the co-requisite model, we can kind of talk about some of those things in general, but each of the, the campuses are going to interpret that a little bit different and implement it differently. So we wanna keep that in mind. Um, but when I see this information about the Minnesota state system, I am kind of also thinking about some of the parallels that we have in our Minnesota adult basic education system. Lots of different programs, different delivery sites, and we are serving a lot of students as well. And, you know, I think about the students that I've helped and worked with transitioning from adult education to post-secondary. So there's definitely some shared students that we have in common, but there's also shared goals that we have between these two large systems. Um, I pulled this information from the Minnesota State webpage. Um, and they sound like a similar vision and mission that we have in adult education. 
um, providing access to quality education. Um, ABE and Minnesota State is crucial to our workforce, right? We've got um, change, a changing economy, changing work fields, different community needs, and our systems are there to help with that. And ultimately, more than a certificate, a GED, a diploma, um, a short-term training certificate, it's about providing a future for people and affecting their families and their communities. That's really that lifelong learning and ultimate goal in all of this. So I'm gonna pass it now to Anthony Miller, who's gonna share about P20, another one of those terms, maybe you've heard it, maybe you haven't, but he's gonna um, explain some of these concepts to us. Thank you, Carly. Um, yeah, so I'm Anthony Miller. I'm the system director of P20 and student success at Minnesota State. I also started in August, so quite new to the role, um, but happy to be here and, and connect with you all. So. Um, the the unit the p20 unit really has um kind of an underlying focus on student success and access um we have a number of areas of focus right now we're, we're as you'll hear about looking at developmental education and course placement today but this is also a unit that does dual enrollment and academic partnerships including working with the department of corrections and and, and other things like that to really provide access into um, the the college pathways for for students at various levels. Um, so that is um, kind of driven by an idea that we need to really think about how we can equitably approach this work. Um, one of the things that has been a real area of focus for Minnesota State under our Equity Twenty Thirty goals and, and also ties into state expectations um, and, and generally the move in higher ed is to really look at disaggregated data around how things are affecting various student groups and are there equity gaps in what we're doing and how we can address those so that we are truly serving the, the population with state um, as best we can. So yeah, um, next slide, please. One of those that's really focusing on, on that particular piece is, is course placement. Um, one of the things that has been a common concern, I would say, across developmental education for, for quite a few years is a recognition that, that there tends to be a disproportionate placement of students of color or, or, or um, you know, sometimes students from other specific backgrounds into developmental education um, and really thinking about how do we make sure that developmental education is being used to serve the students who best need it, that students are being um, placed accurately and that we're not creating obstacles that are based more on who a student is versus what they can do. And so it's really sort of taking an, a, a look at all the fun, foundational parts of the work and thinking about where are there structural obstacles that maybe have been introduced to this process. One of the things that you'll hear about today is guided self-placement. And we are working on an update to our system policy and procedure. Um, we're targeting a, well, essentially the end of this year, we're hoping the, po the process has completed. But the the goal is to really move towards a, a, a true multiple measures placement approach. So that would incorporate various ways for students to demonstrate their readiness. Guided self-placement is one portion of that, um, but it also includes things like high school GPA, um, various test measures like um, the GED or PSAT or MCAs, you know, things that are already in there, but really broadening that range and, and making sure that students have multiple ways to demonstrate their readiness so that the um, there's a lessening of the reliance on a single high stakes measure. Oftentimes, you know, so placement can come down in the in the old model when a lot of it was done by a single high stakes test. You know, things like test anxiety, test taking, comfort. You know, just sometimes being the first thing you're asked to do when you show up on campus is take a test that determines your placement. These things had. Um, different impacts on students that weren't necessarily reflective of 
their actual ability to be successful in courses. And so we're, we're trying to take a more holistic approach. Um, next slide, please. And related to that, with the shift in how we're looking at developmental education and moving towards uh, a more co-requisite model base for the curriculum is really looking at the, the, the overall curriculum sequence and how that affects student success. Um, one of the things that has been observed, you know, for I would say close to two decades at this point in, in research is that lengthy developmental education sequences as they are currently structured tend to lead to a fair amount of attrition. Uh, I guess I would say high amount of attrition. And that is including students who are successful in these courses, you know, successfully complete these courses. Um, one of the things that is a benefit of the co-requisite model is that it reduces the number of exit points and it reduces the time spent in that sequence. And that has had really transformative impacts on overall success rates, uh, completion rates, retention rates, and truly long-term degree and program completion rates in places that have really implemented this model at scale. Um, the benefits really come from a number of, of I guess, core ideas, but some of them are making sure that students are connected into courses that feel like they are actively part of their program process as early as possible, um, making sure that students have strong support that is directly tied to that course content um, so that it feels relevant, it feels timely, it feels um, directly beneficial. And generally speaking, in the co-requisite models as they are currently implemented, you'll be working with the same instructor at both the college level and the developmental co-requisite support course so that you have that extra time and extra um, sort of relational opportunity to spend time with a faculty member um, to increase the um, kind of awareness of where students are struggling and, and tailoring more individualized help for them. So, this in combined with in combination with the course placement changes is really looking at how we at Minnesota State provide entry into our program curriculum, our institutions, and making sure that students are being again placed accurately for their overall success and given the support that that is most likely to achieve that success across um, the sort of core discipline you know core i guess skill sets or disciplines in mathematics writing reading um which are where the the core requisite model is is being developed over the next few years so that's kind of an overview of where we're at again the the core through line is really focusing on equitable access and overall student success and really taking a, a systemic approach across our you know, various institutions to try and do that at scale for the, the population of the state of Minnesota and the students who are looking to come into our system and, you know, Im improve their job prospects or just challenge themselves in whatever way is, is most appealing to them at the time. Well, thank you for that context and um, setting up uh, the rest of the presentations here. So we are going to move on now to this first concept of ability to benefit. And Larry is here to share about that. Thank you. Great. Thanks everyone. Um, I work at the system office for Minnesota State and I work on, um, uh, my position is the director of adult equity strategy. So I work on a lot of credit to non-credit or non-credit to credit programs. Um, as well as working with um, some issues on adult, like bar barriers for adult learners. Um, ability to benefit, uh, some of you may be familiar with it. This is its kind of second big go around, maybe third, depending on how you count it. Um, but ability to benefit allows a student who's not received a high school diploma or equivalency to be eligible for federal student aid, Pell Grants, essentially, and Minnesota State financial. Um, and what it does is 
It allows students who uh, may not have completed their high school to start taking some, or their high school equivalency, um, to start taking classes that are uh, at the college level while working towards um, their high school um, diploma or equivalency, or uh, equivalency essentially. So the, the advantage here are for students who've been out of school but have learned a lot, um, have generally good skills, and um, they must be enrolled in an approved career pathway program, um, which we'll talk a little bit about, a little bit more about. Essentially, um, what it allows is any of these students who are um, eligible, who anyone who is shown that they can benefit from the education can start taking college courses while they complete their high school equivalency and receive federal financial aid. Um, we have a state plan that is approved for three years from um, 8 of 22 to 8 of to, to um, August of 2025. Within that, um, we have certain uh, requirements, um, but it also loosens some of the rules. So one of the things I'll talk about, guided self-placement next, um, kind of plays into a little bit of what we're doing with ability to benefit. Uh, next slide. So how it can work is, um, how do you qualify for ability to benefit? You can do it in three ways. Um, we're only, as a group, um, kind of the group that I work in at the system office, supporting the middle way. So you can pass an independently administered test approved by the U.S. Department of Education. In Minnesota, that would be the Accuplacer, and we have specific scores for it. But we don't support that largely because we don't have the capacity. But um, a college could allow a student in through ability to benefit through that process. Also, a student who completes at least six college credits applicable towards a degree or certificate offered by an accredited post-secondary institute. Um, obviously, the, the challenge there is getting those college credits paid for. Them. And then finally, complete a process approved by the Secretary of Education. That's a state-defined process. And within our process, um, we include, you can still take the Accuplacer if you want, or you can go through a guided self-placement process. As I mentioned, I'll talk about that more, but each one of these, but this pathway is designed and also has some accountability built in to ensure that we're doing um, professional development and we're providing all the services that um, are required under ability to make. Next slide. Um, so how to qualify. Um, so if a student comes and wants to be a part of ability to benefit, they have to, um, they must be enrolled in an eligible career pathway program. Um, so that means something that it essentially means and in, in how it's operationalized is that they have to be in a, in a pathway that leads to a credential that is a, that leads to a well, a high paying or in-demand career. Phrase. Um, so within that requirement is um, also that they complete their high school credential um, and they must be at the college level. So a student, say a student wants to be go into, um, say, CNC machining, um, they could be taking those classes um, at the same time that they're working towards their high school credential. One critical thing, and this goes to the placement with guided self-placement or acuplacer, the ability to benefit student and not use financial aid for developmental education. The point of ability to benefit is just that in its title is, do you have the ability to benefit from post-secondary education? And if so, um, we can get you into those courses at the same time we want you working on your high school credential because if you, even if you get a credential from Minnesota State, you're going to have a challenge getting a job without a high school credential of some sort. Next slide. I'm not sure how many we've got. So we're working with, um, I believe that's nine. I may have to recount or someone else wants to for me. We're working with nine colleges currently. Um, each one of these have identified specific pathways that are ability to benefit. Um, and those are specific areas uh, specific credentials that they are um, offering that qualify that we've approved and that they can offer um, 
outside of or provide student support services, as well as ensuring um, data collection. So it's Hennepin, Hennepin Tech, Lake Superior, Minneapolis, Minnesota State College Southeast, Northwest Technical, Pine Technical, Riverland, St. Paul, and South Central. Other colleges can accept students outside of the state plan, but again, because of our limited capacity, we're not necessarily supporting that, but we can give you some basic information on it. For those um, that are interested in working, if you work with any of these colleges and you're not familiar with it, feel free to drop me a note and I can put you in touch with the folks kind of organizing it for that group so that you can communicate a little bit more about how it's working. But essentially, each one of these campuses is working with us on these specific pathways that they have identified for their campuses. And we're hoping that it expands. But first, we want to get through this first year. Pine has enrolled uh, the first students, and we're kind of excited about that. Um, is the basic concept of what I'm talking about clear to everyone? I want to leave it open for a question if I wasn't clear on the front end. Jim is usually better at explaining the, the beginning part of this than I. All right, um, so ability to benefit for adult students is, is not gonna produce a huge number of students, but for those students who can work through it and who it will help, it can be a great program for them in, in kind of speeding up their process towards a, a, a good, good career that they're gonna enjoy. Next slide. So with this, um, some of this is really falls more in Anthony's field, um, but part of it is that it also crosses over to ability to benefit. So a second area that I've worked on, I've worked on is guided self placement. Um, it's in, it's called a few different things. Um, I'm going to call it guided self placement. What it defi is defined as, so as I mentioned, it's one of the ways that people can qualify for um, ability to benefit. So instead of taking the AccuPlacer test and all the test anxiety and challenges that has for students, especially who've been out of high school for a long time or out of school for a long time, guidance of placement refers to a method of placement in which the student is ultimately in control of deciding which developmental or college level course to take, but arrives at that decision through a process guided by the college. That means the college, an interactive process between the student and an advisor or someone at the college to kind of discuss where they are in terms of their abilities um, for beginning courses such as math and reading writing uh, or ELL in some cases, though that's not a big area that I focus on. As such, um, what it takes, it provides an alternative means of placement that takes into account what a student has learned throughout their, throughout their life and a way to capture that that isn't a standardized test. Next slide. This goes in, this is a little bit, a um, little bit dense, but let me give you the, I'll kind of try and kind of sum it up, sum it up. So guided self-placement is a way to place students in as they come into to ability to benefit for one, but also um, it, probably will be a part of uh, placement as we go forward. Anthony mentioned that some of this is, is has been in recommendations, um, and I'll give you a little bit of the background there. So currently, current placement at Minnesota State is a little bit all over the place. Multiple measures course placement um, it ha is the current policy. Um, we have a couple pilots around campuses, though, that change that. MMCP itself is two placement methods, such as high school GPA and a standardized test, SAT, ACT, MCA, or ACCUPLACER. Um, if a student does not have a high school GPA, as a lot of the adult students that people in this, this group are going to work with, um, it defaults to ACCUPLACER. It um, covers reading, writing, algebra one, stats one, and English language and learners. So the pilots, um, which a lot of you have probably experienced, are high school GPA alone and guided self-placement, which I just mentioned, and a smaller pilot for Alex with PPL um, for mathematics. Uh, currently, the Assessment for Course Placement Committee, which Anthony kind of uh, chairs, has made recommendations for additional ways to place students in these courses. Those will go to Academic Affairs Councils for two readings and ultimately by the ch Chancellor will make the decision. 
The pilots will be coming to an end. Um, expect changes to occur, but the basic process is likely to be based on the recommendations coming out of ACPC. A big part of what has what is likely to change with these recommendations, new tests are likely to be recognized in some form. Um, they could be recognized in a couple different ways, uh, but the PSAT is included, but especially for this audience, GED and TABE will be accepted for placement under the current recommendations. That could change, but I did want to mention it as something that for adult learners specifically were included and really um, could be a huge benefit for students in that it provides a test they've already taken and not requiring another test that they have to go through to be placed. Next, next slide. Um, GSP is probably likely to be a part of the final recommendations. I don't think I'm um, wrong there. It currently, um, as many of you may have experienced, implementation has been pretty uneven. Some ca uh, campuses have implemented it in a variety of ways. It came out of um, basically not being able to give everyone the acupuncture during um, the pandemic. And we just kind of continued until we could come up the recommendations for a fuller suite of a fuller process. Um, so hopefully uh, one of the recommendations is that it's strongly recommended an interactive process and more structure and guidance for campuses. Um, and I think that's true. And it's something that has an ability to benefit. Um, we offer, uh, we also offer to, to help out with kind of creating that process and ensuring that it fits what's needed. Given their career pathways, they often don't need algebra one in the first place or stats. And then they may or may or reading and reading and writing may be slightly different as well, depending on what the program is. Um, it's focused on students without a high school GPA is more likely what, what we're likely to see. Um, ELL has some exceptions there, but it reduces to about 10 to 20% of new students, making it a little bit more doable in terms of the, uh, the, the staff hours it's gonna take to kind of do this well. Um, optional for campuses and current recommendations and will not require the accurate placer for those in GSP, but will be recognized system-wide. So, some campuses may not adopt uh, according to the current recommendations. Those are all subject to change though. I wanna say that. But one thing that I think was in strong agreement was once someone's placed, that'll be recognized system wide. Um, so if someone is at one campus, it'll be recognized at another campus if they do. Um, it'll be locally developed with guidelines and should include an understanding of the student's goals and experiences. A key part of the program will be recommendations from a trusted partner such as program. This and the tests, especially, I wanted to highlight um, that we're including TABE and GED in the current recommendations, whether they still have to go through that process. Um, but the, there are um, some specific things for ABE that um, are kind of made it into these recommendations that I think will be really strong, assuming that they, they, they remain in there. Um, and ways of kind of cementing partnerships between ABE and some of our colleges, such as creating these trusted partner relationships where you can get a letter of recommendation from an AEB instructor who knows a student and that should qualify as placement as well. Um, that may work slightly differently in different campuses, but it's something to keep in mind. And hopefully as we see a lot more cooperation in developmental ed, and kind of prerequisite processes, we can also see that in some of the placement policy. I think that's my, do I have another slide? Let's check. No, I think that's it. So there's a lot more there on both of those topics. Um, I covered them pretty quickly. Um, I think I'm staying in my timeline, but um, if there are more questions, we'll have a breakout for ability to benefit. And I think there's another breakout for guided self-placement that's possible. So thanks everyone and I'll be available. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, nice to follow Larry and Anthony uh, and Russ Frankel. I'm a long time regional transition coordinator um, in three different areas in the state. And for a number of years have been involved with statewide developmental education, adult basic education, classroom partnerships. And um, I'm tag teaming this presentation along with uh, Leslie Blicker, 
who will you'll be hearing from shortly. And also, um, uh, we have in the room until two o'clock, Anthony Miller, who you've also heard from, who's the P20 uh, director, and he can speak uh, to much more of the detail of the requisite model. Next slide, please. You know, the problem and the challenge that uh, we face in the Minnesota state system and uh, it is, is that um, campuses are, are open for enrollment for interested adults. Re whether they're ready, uh, academically ready for college, the rigors of college or not. And so what happens as you've just heard is there's this placement process and essentially uh, students who are not prepared quite for the rigors of college have to complete developmental education. Okay? And that might place them in one course, it might place them in a numerous courses. And that's a challenge. That's a challenge for students uh, on a couple of fronts. One, it's time it's, and it's money. And so the partnerships that we speak of um, really take a look at how can we, um, in the most expedient fashion possible, help students move to credit-bearing courses uh, within the system and onto that pathway that we speak of to their sort of career of interest. Next slide, please. So where did this work all begin? So for many years, uh, there's been these, you know, partnerships that have existed within various, uh, within various ABE consortia throughout the state and with their local campuses. I happen to have been doing a lot of work with the Northwest region for the last roughly a dozen plus years. And what I noted in that area was there were a number of successful partnerships that were happening on campuses in which they could demonstrate uh, that um, that structural issue that Anthony spoke of, which was this completion and retention problem um, where there were increased, significantly increased rates where we had partnerships in place where adult basic education instructors were working in concert with faculty on college campuses to support students uh, that have, you know, some real strong academic uh, challenges that they're facing in that de developmental education classroom. So in the Northwest region, there was this desire to increase the number of instances of coursework and also to get into some campuses where this partnership uh, work was not occurring. And so um, that particular work in the Northwest quickly grew to a statewide approach to this work. And in the process of that, um, we were able to document best practices and the existing Minnesota partnerships, um, develop and share resources, others seeking to create a partnership. We have a toolkit and some other things that have been created. And in this um, work that occurred throughout a number of years, it became abundantly clear that there were lots of people on both sides of the equation, uh, administrators, instructors, uh, faculty uh, in both systems that had an interest to come together periodically. And so we formed an affinity group. Last February, we held a statewide symposium for sharing of ideas. And um, as of just this past August, 2023, we have 24 partnerships at 21 of the 32 year colleges. Next slide, please. So why do the partnerships work so well? Well, they work well because they play the strengths of both systems. So the unique, unique talents um, are brought to bear on 
that problem I spoke of earlier and that challenge that exists uh, for both students and uh, our Minnesota State campuses. So faculty are content specialists, as they should be, and they bring to bear that, that kind of expertise and work. And then our ABE instructors uh, who are masters of basics of academic reading, writing, as you can see, computational, digital literacy skills, um, as well as problem solving, all of those things that are kind of part and parcel to what it's like to be a community, uh, an adult education student and the support you need to not only be successful in the classroom, but to be successful in your community and broader society. Next slide, please. So this is where my tag team uh, um, a friend, Leslie Blicker, who's been working on this with me for a number of years, will kind of tell you a little bit more about this work that now is before us. Uh, and so Leslie, if you could come on board, that would be great. And you could take, take it forward to talk a little more deeply about the core requisite model that Anthony um, initiated with us today. Uh, sure. Well, thanks, Russ, and, and hello, everyone. Uh, recognize a few familiar faces here and uh, clearly some new ones. Um, I put uh, what my job role is, has been. You can read it. It's probably the longest one. We know I'm a talker, so you can scroll back up in the chat and see my intro. Anyway, um, Russ provided that as kind of a context for um, the work that we're focusing on now. Now, we're not the experts, just so you know, and I think uh, Russ said this, on a co-rec class, what it is, how it works exactly, how the instructors work together, but we're continuing our work to foster partnerships and to bring the good story, what we call the good story of ABE to light and to bear on the process of moving to a co-rec model because <clears throat> other people believe this and I think uh, Russ and I equally support it. If ever there was a time to have ABE uh, people involved in a class or in a partnership situation, it would probably be under the co-rec situation. So, in spite of all the work and we, you know, we were kind of on a roll documenting these partnerships, last December is when what we called uh, the Minnesota State Memo came out. And the memo, it was a call to form a work group for a limited time frame, just for the spring of 2023. Um, and their charge was to develop a recommendation uh, for an implementation plan related to DevEd and the recommendations were then going to be reviewed through the governance process at Minnesota State, like the Academic Affairs Council, submission to um, various leadership all the way up to the chancellor. Um, and so uh, next slide, please. Uh, here's specifically what the memo was calling for. Um, I mentioned the work group already uh, but it said, Minnesota State will eliminate all standalone sequential pre prerequisite uh, DevEd courses by the fall of 2026. And uh, if I don't get back to it, remind me, because there's been a postponement to, of that date, but I'll mention it a little bit later. All DevEd coursework would now be, at time of implementation, would now be in a co-requisite format tied to a college level course. So again, dev ed courses go away. Uh, now instructors, whether they've ever taught the dev ed population or not, instructors of a credit bearing course, the gateway course into either math or English or reading, writing, would now be working with the dev ed, what was formerly considered the dev ed population or underprepared, you know, less prepared students um, in a credit bearing course. Um, and, uh, and it says all reading English, mathematics and English as a second language, other language would be included. All that coursework would be included in the co-rec model. 
uh, the implementation plan would draw upon the math pathways co-rec work currently being um, implemented in the Minnesota state system. So next, uh, next slide. So, and before I do, I'll circle back to that notion about 2026. Anthony is here and he did reveal to us a little bit earlier today, uh, we were meeting just prior to this, that the recommendations of the work group did go through the governance process and they were sent out uh, uh, last week, I believe, um, to all of the campuses. And uh, from my understanding, what the recommendations, we don't, we don't have it in front of us. Um, sorry, I'm just checking a few notes here. But what Larry, what uh, Anthony told us is their recommendations for implementing. So they would cons you know, consist of things like the timeline for this, staffing, budgeting to support the work, um, and that the date for full implementation has been moved to 2027. So we can't be real specific, but that's what we know so far and we wanted to share with you. So this slide, and I know we've got about another minute or two here. And so um, what this slide says is, yeah, we know that there are uh, reported, I don't know about documented, but reported benefits nationally. I have the word documented there. And those include things, you've heard it before, about, you know, give students access to support that's efficient, sort of just-in-time learning, it saves students time and money and so forth. Um, and <clears throat> completion rates are going up. However, in our communication, we do these presentations and we have the affinity group. I will say we've heard many concerns, many, many concerns, and it includes things like, well, there's a deep investment in the wraparound services in order for this to work. And the question is, is there funding at the campuses for this since they're already somewhat struggling with that? Um, guided self-placement has come up that people are concerned that guided self-placement, one person said, and I quote, it's antithetical to the co-rec model. So Larry, I'm sure you heard that at one of the meetings. Uh, faculty would still be encountering a wide range of student readiness issues from a lack maybe of stringent placement and that it only increases uh, the risk of student success. Students who have never worked, for example, with fractions or negatives before, how are they gonna go be put, you know, how will they do, I should say, perform in a class with a lot of college algebra? So that's what we've heard from folks. So next slide, last slide, is this is kind of what we're working on this year. Russ and I have been uh, commissioned through Minnesota Department of Education to provide uh, continuity in the affinity group. We have a couple meetings uh, left for the year. If you haven't heard about it, feel free to privately message us here, or if you're interested in any of this, come to the breakout group and we can answer more questions. But our focus is um, we're just, Russ and I are going around and saying, what's the status of the previously existing partnership that you had? 24 partnerships statewide. It was an incredible model that seemed to be working and helping student success. Now there's sort of a stop, you know, stop doing that because now the campuses need to start planning for the COREC model. So some of the partnerships are off to the side, they're on hold, and they're not necessarily continuing on momentarily. We're continuing to offer opportunities for discussions around the COREC model. And, and the biggest one, the biggest focus is the third item. How can ABE support Minnesota State to realize college and adult student success under the new model? That's really what we're focusing our conversations on. We're not experts, but we're trying to learn from it and inform Minnesota State along the way. So that concludes it, and uh, I'll, I guess I'll uh, go offline at the moment. Thank you, Russ and Leslie and all of our presenters so far. So after hearing kind of the 
basic breakdown, digging a little bit deeper into these three areas. Now it's time to get a little bit more comfortable with some of these concepts, and we're going to um, move into a breakout room. We're actually going to combine the um, first two breakout rooms listed on this slide. We're going to have ability to benefit um, alongside guided self-placement, we're going to put that um, those groups together. And then there's going to be a separate room um, with Russ and Leslie facilitating the co-requisite model. Just looking at the number of participants that we have in the session, it kind of made sense to combine things so that we can have a true discussion. And um, I want to remind everybody that we have that Google Doc where we can add um, questions and take notes and everybody is welcome and encouraged to do that, um, to add notes um, in that document. So Marisa is gonna help us get into breakout rooms and it's gonna be 30 minutes and then we'll come back together and do um, a general share out.